All right, cool. So um, I've got an appointment after this, so I can't stay too long. Uh, my name's Jordan. I'm not really affiliated with the party or any party in particular. Um, I just have some ideas I'd like to propose and get some feedback. So I've written down a little speech. I'd like to give it if you'll lend me your ears. Um, in general, to be elected, parties have to, have to offer something new. Um, the new thing that many people, or the biggest thing that people with have problems with in this country is feeling like they're not being heard. Uh, when the country was being founded, the original framers were worried about a natural limit to democracy. Indeed, in a federal, Federalist paper published on Friday, November 30th, 1787, Madison thought that the natural limit of a republic is that distance from the center which will barely allow the representatives to meet as often as may be necessary for the administration of public affairs. So that's a lot of old timey speak. Basically what Madison was saying was that when this country was designed, the greatest impediment to the democratic process was whether or not people could physically get to the place of governance. Yet even as our technology has changed, our government essentially runs the same way it has since the 1700s. With 300 uh, million people across the world, our federal system has been stressed to the breaking point. And with the election of Donald Trump to the President of the United States and the systemic corruption openly acting in our political industries today, the time is now to try and rectify this core issue with the Federal Republic of the United States. So to do this, I am proposing that any party so motivated could produce an, an open online discussion system whereby members of the party could openly discuss issues, present an evidence, and come to a unified conclusion. The end goal of a party would that be, once it's elected to power, that uh, party would grow and modify the system so that it can be used to run uh, state and federal uh, agencies, essentially. So the idea is you're getting a more accountable system by allowing everybody to see the discussion and the evidence that's presented, and you're getting a more open system. And more importantly, you're offering something different to people that are currently disenfranchised. So right now, if you're running the same basically game that the Democrats and Republicans are running, where you're trying to compete in the same primaries where you are vastly outweighed and outmatched, you're not going to really be, in my opinion, I'm not, I mean, I haven't done this a ton. I went to a couple schools for it, but you're not going to win because they have all the resources. So the idea here is to offer a more direct platform for your potential voter base to contact you. Second proposal I have uh, is a new tax plan, which I'd like to refer to as the Kickstarter for taxes. Um, private citizens would pay a portion of their paycheck relative to their income. But when you submit your taxes, you would be able to choose what departments or projects you want those taxes earmarked for. So that's 50% of the budget is what you want it to be. The other 50% of the budget would come from the states and federal government taxing corporations. And that would be the government's own discretionary funding. So that might make up for any, so like let's say, nobody wants to fund the new, um, the new sports arena one year, the second year it's being built. The government would dip into its discretionary funding to fix that. So I'm coming to the Pirate Party, and the reason I'm here is because uh, since it's such a tech-enabled um, party, you know, you guys kind of stand on that, at least from the history I've read in Switzerland. Uh, you guys seem to be like the most likely candidate to produce a system like this. Um, my ideal outcome from this would uh, be, you know, you guys uh, give some feedback and then hopefully find some like-minded minds or development talent or just people who want to get interested and then create it. So I mean, I'd like to hear, so I, I have, uh, a little bit of time left. Um, I'd like to just hear some thoughts from you guys, if you have any. Uh, is that all right if I ask for questions in the middle? Okay. Well, I, I'm worried because folks keep leaving. Uh, okay. But I will tell you what. Let's give it five minutes of questions, and then I actually have to go soonish too. So yes. Oh, comment. I made a video with a similar premise called crowdfunding the state. Uh huh. So is that I, on YouTube? It's on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. So I, I like the idea. Awesome. Um, are you a developer? Oh, don't we all? <laughs> I'm building a video game right now. Um, anybody else? Yeah? Um, as opposed to like instant return voting and collecting past, do you support ideas like a blue ocean strategy where you take a political party, what I've been talking about with libertarians, is take the third party, a big ten third party, and aim it at like large cities and you know, state Democrat states and districts um, where you have lots of grassroots progressive activists already. So I haven't heard of the ter terminology you're using, but basically it sounds like you're asking um, make a 
a medium common denominator party and then get everybody to kind of like put their support behind it. Uh, I think that's a good idea. That's kind of what I'm proposing here with this discussion forum. So the key thing here is that when you get to the f when you get to a higher level, um, so in the beginning you're using it to organize with other pirate parties in other states. So you're shuffling resources around. Has anybody here been in Occupy? No. Okay. Yes. A couple. All right. So I was on the online side of Occupy, and their biggest mistake was they they said they were a, a excuse me I should say we said that we were a online enabled like movement but they didn't really use online stuff for coordinating between states. Everything was very localized. So the idea behind this initially is that you use it to coordinate your party across state lines. And then once you get enough momentum and mass to get elected in a particular state, then you bring other people into that fold and start using your discussion platform. So the idea is that like even a Democrat, Republican, Green Party, whatever you want to label yourself as, you're still using the platform. It's kind of like, I don't want to use the term Trojan horse because it implies a negative connotation. Um, but basically, you are getting your party elected, and since your party uses this system, then by default, the government then uses that system. And then now the government and everybody involved in it is using this online discussion platform. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. I guess, I guess what I meant by Blue Ocean strategy is, is if you take one political party and focus on especially urban issues and issues affecting younger people, more diverse groups, you can focus on those issues that would probably be a good way to, to work with it. Um, if you'd like, so my website is jordanpalovitz.com. It's on the website, and my email's on there. So if you'd like to talk more, feel free to send me an email. Can you spell that? Uh, Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N, P-E-L-O-V-I-T-Z, as in Zulu, dot com. Um, do I have any other questions? OK, let's wrap it up. Your turn. Uh, it doesn't, so feel free to name it. <laughs> um, the second one was Kickstarter for taxes, but we can come up with something for the other one. Sorry, what was that, sir? Do you have an idea? <laughs> okay, that works. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so I actually had, had brought a little, um, let me backtrack a little bit. So um, interestingly to me, as somebody who's worked on numerous different issues over my whole life in lots of different movements. Um, it has been particularly dramatic to me that um, the foreclosure crisis and what underlies or over arches <laughs> the foreclosure crisis has somehow been relatively invisible. Um, the private party folks here in Massachusetts have made uh, somewhat of a priority of at least paying attention to this issue. Um, I like to start with this fact because I think for folks who believe in popularism, democracy, uh, any of that kind of stuff, um, the fact that the majority of the top 1% or top 0.01% has gotten its wealth from um, this source, right? The, the uh, hedge funds were uh, built off of subprime mortgages and funded uh, largely, not only, they, they dipped into a lot of different kinds of illegal financial schemes, um, but certainly subprime lending was the majority of it. And the foreclosures, um, well, so the uh, historic housing bubble that we've talked about, and I'm sure people have heard at least a little bit about, was from this time period of 2002 to 2007. It also happens to be the time period when the wealth of the 1% increased 10 times faster than the rest of us. Um, and they were making their money off of this historic housing bubble. If you're sort of economist leaning in your way of thinking about things, you can look up what percentage of uh, society's wealth tends to be tied up in the land. Um, I recently saw something that said it was 79%. The financial industry figured out that they wanted to continue to reap massive profits, and the way they needed to do that was to dip into the wealth that is tied to property. And this is how they did it. They did it with subprime mortgages. Um, like with many areas of our lives, it's where you have lots and lots of people with a relatively small investment is where most of the money is. And so the question is, how did the financial industry get their hands on that? They got their hands on it by looking at the largest wealth investment of most regular people, which was is maybe 
still, um, our homes. And so even if you didn't care about foreclosures, you didn't care about people losing their homes, you didn't care about the unraveling of our um, legal rights to own it, property, uh, real property, or our homes, one would think that lots of folks who are concerned about the wealth divide would at least be looking at the question of where's what's feeding the wealth divide at this point. And although I've worked on and I totally celebrate the work around minimum wage, that is not where they're getting their money. Yes, the fact that people are not getting paid anywhere near enough to live on on minimum wage obviously has a big impact on our regular lives. But in terms of where the very wealthy are getting their wealth, they're getting it here. Um, so I brought with me for fun, um, if folks are, are, are into it enough, a little quiz. Uh, all right, well, I'm going to drag you back. You're welcome to keep perusing your way through this if you want. So this is the historic housing bubble. And um, the, uh, the entire market crash, when we started organizing around foreclosures in, the, in 2007 and then the beginning of 2008, um, one of the members of our coalition, our little tiny coalition at that point, had said, follow the money. You should follow the money. If you want to know what's going on and why we've got this problem, you've got to follow the money. And what they showed us was that the money to fund subprime mortgages had really changed what was going on, right? Originally, you got a mortgage, you got a note, you bought your home. You bought it with a local bank. And the local bank actually put its money into the mortgage. And it sat there for 30 years while you paid it off. Um, if you follow the money for what was done starting in the early 1990s all the way through till they had sort of perfected their subprime mortgages, um, the money was everywhere. So I mentioned the hedge funds, but what had happened was that everybody invested to some extent in the subprime mortgages. We knew uh, once we started looking at the um, entire market and the way it was built or the quicksand, I don't know if built is even the right way to put it, that it was going to crash. And so I went up to the state house in early 2008 and um, asked and went around uh, lobbying for legislation to try and protect people. And I would tell the Massachusetts state legislators that the world, this was going to tear down, was going to pull down the world economy. And they all thought I had three heads. I mean, you could just tell they thought I was completely nuts. And of course, we ended up being right. Yeah? Yeah. Why would anybody logically sink their money into a subprime mortgage unless, uh, and they widened the scope of it so that anybody could sink it in a hedge fund or anybody else unless they thought the government was going to underwrite a guarantee to securitize it? Well, so Moody's. Moody's and the, and the credit rating agencies, um, and Moody's just lost a big lawsuit to the feds, um, essentially misrated mis, uh, these, no, these assets. They did not. If you go read the literature, because they, they were idiots. They, they drank the Kool-Aid. The government would repay it once it defaulted, so they didn't care if it was high risk. No. Moody's. No, read the literature. It's just not true. When you read what folks said, it's not, they did not, they really didn't know what was going on. And it's why I like this chart, because this is from the Boston Federal Reserve. And as you guys no doubt know, the Federal Reserve funds studies of every single economic indicator under the sun. And this was one, this is one of their charts. So this is exactly how they didn't know. So this is what happens when you get a bunch of folks who believe their own story. They get this chart, and this is one of, I don't know, 600 or something indicators that they track. And they looked at it, and they went, look at this. The, how, the price to own a home, this is a ratio between owning and cost to own a home and cost to rent a home. And they went, oh my god, look at that. The cost to own a home went way out of control. We've never seen figures like this. So the researcher I got this from, I got, them, got it from them um, right uh, as everything was beginning to obviously crash. And um, he said, you know, we looked at it. We thought, that is really weird. We've never seen anything like that. And we stuffed it in a drawer because we couldn't explain it. Um, and folks may remember that Greenspan got called in when everything crashed. Um, he had already retired. He gets called in by Congress. And they say, what the hell? And he says, you know, I think all our equations are wrong. We don't really know what we're doing. And I have no idea how we missed it. Now, not everybody missed it. And I agree with you, it should have been obvious. We can't believe that the banks didn't figure out that if you move from regular lending criteria to really bad lending uh, criteria. They told the banks that uh, housing was sold a right and that they would require that housing prices be sold for the market price. And they didn't have to do that. They just said, well, we're going to do it. And they did it. And they 
loan money to more repayment risk. Also not true. So I, I know ideologically there are a bunch of folks who believe this, but that's actually not in the literature of what happened. What happened was the bank regulating, I'm telling you, I've got source documents on it. So the bank regulators actually were up in arms about the subprime mortgages, but no one was listening to them. Somebody else who no one was listening to was the FBI in 2004, sent a report to the Congress and uh, various elements of the federal government going, oh my God, we're getting so many complaints that the SNL bailout is gonna look like a walk in the park. You've gotta do something. But folks may remember in 9-11 and the aftermath that uh, Bush took all of the resources out of all of the elements of the FBI that was not focused on um, the military threat. Um, and so that section of the FBI no longer had staff to track down the number of fraudulent complaints they were getting. And that's why they contacted Congress and said, we're in trouble. They didn't get any real response. So I agree with you. It should have been totally obvious. All you had to do was follow the money. But unfortunately, they were so busy drinking the Kool-Aid that they didn't catch it. Yeah. They were. I'm agreeing with you. Go ahead. Right, well, there's bigger problems even than that. But can I, can I let this woman please, she had her hand up. I just, um, it just, I hope you're not saying that the reason we have the problem is because, oops, because the people who, who Oh, no, no, no. Client, I think it was correct. <laughs> It was, it, was, it was totally intentional because we know that the worst of the mortgages were targeted, for instance, at people of color and women heads of household. And women, uh, women heads of households, and actually this is true in much of the world, have much higher credit ratings than men in comparable positions, and yet they got the subprime mortgages. So we know it was very intentional. What, was, what, what I'm saying was not apparently in their head was that they thought they could do this and it wouldn't crash the market. <laughs> My sister is an undergrad, and I remember before 2008 her telling me about the people they were giving loans to, and I said, this is really bad. And she didn't seem to realize that this was They had no bad. connection. There was no connection. But how could anyone not know? I agree with you, but I read the literature, and so there's a great story. Yeah, go ahead. I, when I bought my house, right after the crash started, uh, my real estate agent said, you know what, they were giving out loans to people. They didn't even have to have uh, verify credit history. They didn't have to verify a payment. They could just say, oh, I work for my uncle. Your uncle vouch for you. They would give them a absolutely true, but it turns out that's not the best predictor of, of why someone will get foreclosed. So the problem was the bubble. Because it turns out the best predictor of whether you're going to be foreclosed or not is the year you got the mortgage. Doesn't matter what was prime, subprime, doesn't matter what your credit rating was, doesn't matter what neighborhood you lived in. What matters is how overpriced was the house. So, um, you know, you don't have to believe me. You could actually go read the, the primary documents and I can give them to you. But I, I spend my life on this and, and trust me, I actually have seen all the statistics that are pretty much out there. Um, so yes, the problem was they were giving out loans willy-nilly, but it wasn't because of who they were giving them to, it's what they were giving people. They were giving everybody something that was unaffordable. Um, so if you look at, uh, there's a recent lawsuit, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac actually had been investing themselves uh, separately from the mortgages that they had. They actually were taking some of their money and investing them in subprime mortgage those bundled mortgages, those, the toxic assets, and they sued 16 of the bundlers, the securitizers. 14 of them, these are, you know, there are not that many of them out there and they're huge. Um, 14 of them settled without going to court. I think they didn't want anybody to see their dirty laundry and of course we can't see it if it's settlement. Um, but two of them actually decided to fight Fannie and Freddie who, you know, are like possibly the largest, I think, safely the largest financial institutions in the world. And um, Fannie and Freddie beat one of them, and you can see it's a fabulous case, FHA v. Nomura, if you want to read 361 pages of a federal judge who really did their homework. Um, but what it came down to was the thing that she said, 
was the most uh, overarching and persuasive issue was the overpricing of the mortgages that people were given. So you go and you get a mortgage and you're told, oh, the house is worth $250,000. Here's a mortgage for $250,000. Turns out the property wasn't worth that. It was really only worth $200,000. Well, now, the day you sign the mortgage, you're underwater and you're significantly underwater. And if it was a prime mortgage, you put down that 20%, it was gone the day you signed the mortgage. And that turns out to be what was the real problem with these mortgages. Now, all of the crazy criteria you were saying, like not having to prove that you had an income or any of that kind of stuff, was basically because that helped the financial industry. They could give a bad mortgage to anybody under the sun. Um, and they did. So I'm going to flash you through this real fast. Um, so in Massachusetts, does a bank have to go in front of a judge to foreclose? Yes or no? No, they don't. So in many states they do, and in some of the states where they do, like New York State, New York State judges are actually managing to dig their teeth in. Um, and maybe we'll get somewhere. All right, uh, who wants to take a shot at number two? What was the median wealth loss to black households in those four years in the US? Any guess? Median wealth loss. Four years, subprime foreclosure years. 53%. You don't know that? You guessed it? Very good. What? Well, yeah. Why did anybody reasonably and logically borrow more than they thought they could repay or more? So I, I think there, there was, well, part of the promise they were told that the houses were going to, just like you were saying, that the houses' values were going to keep increasing infinitely. So that was one problem. But the biggest problem we experienced is that folks went and they thought they were going to a banker who actually had financial, huh? People had no way of knowing it because the right, they, they would get handed five appraisals showing them that the property was worth more than it was. That's why Fannie and Freddie got snagged. Yeah, sorry. It went all the way back to when they, after World War I, when most houses were bought on home mortgages, starting around 1920, in businesses and farms. Uh, going all the way back then, housing values have been going up four years and then Exactly. Absolutely. Right. Right. And once in a while, they'll go up for four years and they won't go down. The correction doesn't happen. And then they keep going up. So they go up eight. And then it really crashes. Exactly. Absolutely. And you and I know that. And one would think the economists knew it. But if you read all the literature, they were all saying we're in a new world. Housing prices are always going to go up. So you, you know. You can say what you want. I agree that folks should have looked at it and gone, this doesn't make sense. But they were saying it against all the expertise they were being handed, on the one hand. The other hand is that we changed the entire economy. It used to be when you got a mortgage, you got it from a banker. Um, during this time period, you did not get it from a banker. You got it from an independent contractor who was hired separately. And people assumed they were still dealing with a bank and with sort of, you know, banking, backing. backing. And of course, these were mortgage companies. They were not regulated. They did whatever they wanted. Um, and in Massachusetts, when in 2007, the state government finally required these folks to be licensed, the folks who were giving out the mortgages, more than 50% of them couldn't get a license, either because they had a criminal record related to financial stuff, or they had fiduciary problems on their, on their background, and so should not have been allowed to give out mortgages at all. So the problem is that people got swindled, and you know, I, I, the, the parallel is, how many of you have ever gotten prescribed something by a doctor? you know, was not aspirin. How many? I have. Did you look it up in the physician desk reference to see if it, com if it combined badly with anything you were taking? So here's the problem. We assume that someone who's a professional knows what they're doing. If you look at the studies for how often doctors give out medication without checking in the physician's desk reference what it, what it is incompatible with, it's a really high number. And these aren't folks who are trained or anything. They were making a fast buck as a broker, and many of them appeared and disappeared very fast. So um, all right, we were on question two. So black households, 53% loss. Anybody want to guess how much uh, wealth Latino households lost? During that four years? No guesses? Either 66 or 34, but I'm not sure which. <laughs> 66? 
Asian households was 34%, and white, white houses was 16%, although we suspect that if you could break it out by quintile, that you would be seeing the loss is all in sort of the second and third quintile, the, the working class <laughs> quintiles. Um, rough estimate of the percentage of Massachusetts residents who lost their home because it was auctioned in a foreclosure. Um, the hidden stat in here is we're talking about both homeowners and renters in those homes, but you want to guess roughly what we think it is? I'm waiting for someone who's a better statistician than me to do this, but um, this is question three. What did anybody guess? One in 50. One in 50. Anybody else? One in 500. One in 500? One in 100. One in 100? One in 15. Um, I would love somebody who's better at census stats than me to run the figures again, but it's somewhere, I've been conservatively saying it's one in 17. So every one of you knows somebody who lost their home and probably several people who lost their home to a foreclosure in Massachusetts if you're a Massachusetts resident. Uh, best predictor, I kind of gave this one away. It's what year it was purchased, by far best predictor. Um, Worst year for foreclosures in the Great Depression was 1931. Um, in the worst years of this crisis, let's say around 2010, uh, what, how do you think the comparison to the rate in the Great Depression was? I'm sorry? One to one. Three times? Anybody else? Two thirds? Yeah, it's over three times. The estimates, and it's hard to do it because they weren't keeping statistics the same way in the Great Depression that we do now, but the estimate is 3.4%. I'm sorry, 3.4 times. Sorry, 3.4 times the, the, the peak of the Great Depression. So the Great Depression was a walk in the park compared to what we've been going through. This has gone on longer. The statistics have been three times as bad, down to one times as bad, depending on what time period we're in. Um, and it's way worse. Um, housing bubble, ah, the crash from the housing bubble, in the Great Depression, compared to the crash of this housing bubble. Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody else? It was about one and an eighth. So it's somewhere between the last two. Um, total number of residential foreclosures in mass in the last 20 years. I know you guys are more outgoing than this. I don't believe it. How many? 92,000. Anybody else? 75. 75, 83. 92,000. Um, given that ident I hope that other people's copies are better than mine, um, given that advocates have identified some 120 violations of Massachusetts mor mortgaging and foreclosure processes by the banks, uh, each of which renders a foreclosure invalid, how many are generally found in the average history of any one foreclosure in Massachusetts? One to four, five to nine, two to 15, 17 to 20, 22 to 25, on average. Huh? Five to nine? 12 to 15? Um, I would say it's probably 17 to 20 or 22 to 25. I just asked a guy recently who admittedly had a little worse of a chain of disadventure, misadventure than most folks, and he stopped counting at 53. He knows this stuff, so he knows what to look for. Most people don't. Um, so common amount of money a homeowner has received in a major legal settlement where the banks got defeated by the feds or by all of the state attorneys general together, uh, what do you think folks are getting back for a, admitted, admitted a foreclosure that happened as part of an admitted uh, illegal scheme? Who? 3,000. 1,000? Huh? Balance due. Balance due? Yeah, well, you guys are better than most audiences. So yeah, it's somewhere around 1, 2,000, maybe 2,500 is the top. The, the um, uh, countrywide lawsuit where they admitted that they had uh, racially profiled and given mortgages out that were uh, unattainable um, and got extra fees for doing it for, to, to uh, households of color, 
people got 2,500, that was a lot for a settlement. So here's, they've taken your largest af asset, your credit rating, everything, and you get no money back. Needless to say, the feds aren't getting much money either. It's that the, they're just not settling for much. Um, stressful life events, I don't know if folks are in, come from psychology backgrounds, but I do. Um, in, in the measure of the list of stressful life events, uh, foreclosure ranks in the bottom one-fifth, second one-fifth, middle one-fifth, second to the top, or top one-fifth? Right at the top. Right at the top. Um, did unemployment drive the increase in foreclosures? No? Anybody else? Yeah, it turns out that if you look at a, a graph, you were talking about the cyclical nature of foreclosures and other economic things. It turns out that if you go back several cycles of um, economic downturns with large unemployment rates, that they have no impact on foreclosures at all. You don't see the foreclosure curve move at all. And in this one, the foreclosure curve goes up and then the unemployment curve follows it behind it. Um, oh yes, yeah, so an increase of 100 foreclosures in a zip code correlates with what percentage increase in suicide attempts, and we're talking about adults, not, focus, not folks over 65 years of age, 10%, 16%, 22 28 34 or 40% increase? 30%. 40%, yep. So if, it, if you look at folks in the, in the uh, I can't remember, up to 40 years old or something, the increase is around 38%. You look at the 40 to 65, it's around 42%. So I went for 40 as a round figure. Anyway, it is much wider than anybody seems to recognize. I generally find that if I tell people it was about 1 in 15, 1 in 17 Massachusetts residents, nobody has a clue how widespread this was. And it's still ongoing. And oh, everything fell asleep. Um, Uh-oh. Do you think we took care of the problem? I would say we're close to not having done much at all because here's the problem. We've done as a movement and we're the only statewide organization in the country. Um, all the rest of the states might have one or two local groups but we're the only statewide coalition. We're a very large coalition. Honored to have the Pirate Party as one of our members. Um, and we um, have, a, I mean, an incredibly wide coalition here, um, but as the only state that has a coalition, it's also the place where the banks are pounding down hardest because we've pushed back the best, not surprisingly. Well, the, the Beacon Hill has done very well by us, but it doesn't matter because the banks just break every, no, it's not. It's actually most foreclosure law is state level and it's different by every state, although there's a lot of overlap. Um, it isn't that, it's, there's no enforcement. So it doesn't matter. We can pass as many laws as we want and we've passed some really, really good ones. Um, that would be the $20 million question. I have a lot of, a lot of pieces of that. Um, part of it is that people think the banks must be telling the truth. I mean, the presumption um, is staggering. It's sort of like people on the ground don't think about it. When you talk to folks who are in enforcement or policy or whatever. One would think that they would want that. You would think they would want solvency. I would think so too. Yes. You would think. So here's the problem is that they, this is a, but it was a slippery slope. So what happened was that the, what they were doing illegal in the 70s was kind of not, not, nobody really paid any attention to it. It wasn't a big deal. It didn't seem to impact the basic solvency of the banks and there were really, really tight banking regulations. By, um, the uh, 1990s is when things really started to go south because in the 1990s, Fannie and Freddie had been making money by bundling mortgages and putting them out on the stock exchange. Why did they do that? Because then they don't have to pay for it. They get investors to pay for it. And so it, it was much more money for Fannie and Freddie. And so what happened was, which is why I was... One would, 
one would think. But the problem is, you know, absolute power may co corrupt absolutely, but absolute greed definitely corrupts absolutely too. The problem is Fannie and Freddie are above the law. They've consistently put themselves in the position where when somebody tries to get after them because they're a government uh, agency, they go, no, we're a quasi, we're not covered by those laws. Also true, but, but even if that weren't true, they think they're a rule unto themselves. You look at their depositions, and we've only gotten a few in this crisis. Well, not a, it's not only no oversight. They run, they're the big kahuna, so they run everything. Anyway. That's the same way, right? Hmm? That is the same way. They print more money. Yeah, the Fed situation, I would say, is, is even worse. But it's hard to know what's worse. They're all so big, and they can do what they want. What happened in the 1990s that pushed this over the edge was that the, the mega banks got, got jealous and they were like, well, why is Fannie and Freddie allowed to bundle mortgages and not pay for them and have investors pay for them? We should be able to do that. So they started rewriting all the basic laws that have to do with the way uh, mortgaging works, foreclosure works, accountability works, et cetera, and ended up um, creating a system where there was now no accountability for them as well as no accountability for Fannie and Freddie. So let me jump to the movement piece because I'm getting the high but, I mean, sign here. Regulatory law, we also need to have the government, the governance and enforcement part of it. And without that, the regulatory law is pretty My important. point is exactly the same. Yeah. 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 So the issue is the only way we people have ever stopped a government when it's completely off the rails is to organize. And so, you know, although foreclosures were not in the Great Depression what they, what they are now, people stopped them by standing on each other's lawns and refusing to let the banks take people's farms. Um, same thing happened with the sharecropper movement. And in fact, if you want to dig back to the last time foreclosures were this bad, it started in 1763 and it led to a thing that some people might have heard of called the American Revolution. I agree with you, but but it didn't have to do with the ability. I hear you, but it didn't have to do with the ability to repay. It had to do with the lending criteria, and they just wandered off. Remember, the banks are regulated; mortgage companies were not. Absolutely, but remember, you're talking now about regular banks, and this creation was the creation of mortgage companies who were not regulated and were, did not have people. Well, they don't. They all went out of business pretty much. Well, 20 yeah. years. Yeah. In my opinion, going all the way back to the 1700s in banking, the cause of all of this is picking winners and losers, corporate bailouts, fractional reserve lending, and a whole house of cards that they built. It's totally true, but this was the collapse. So is that, there are a lot of bad ideas in there, but this was the. Well, strange. A lot of legislative changes that they did. Yeah, well, they got a lot more than 1.5 trillion. Go ahead. So my my mortgage, um, which I got in 2007, uh, when we purchased our home, the uh, real estate broker said, "Okay, so we're signing the mor we're signing the paperwork for the mortgage." He said, "By the time you close, this will probably have been sold to a different servicer." Right. And it was sold to a different servicer before we closed. Um, I mean, the current in, the current version of this mortgage is with a credit union in Somerville. They do the they have the mortgage. They do the service in house. Um, yeah. I feel good supporting a local agency. But going back to you know, this mortgage will likely be sold before you close. Yeah, the campaign. What's the? I mean, how much did that sort of thing play into it? Where you know, I, I felt like the guy who was the guy who was. Um, from the real estate office that was, you know, doing all the checks and stuff. He seemed to be doing due diligence, but the fact that it got unloaded so quickly was... Right, so right. part of, and I'm sorry that our friend left, because part of what created this mess was that it used to be you signed a 30-year mortgage. You figure you're signing it with somebody, and that's not true anymore. You sign it, and it gets passed around, and they slice and dice it, and they do whatever they want to make money out of it. There's no accountability. The big argument is always, and, and it's part of the belief that people got a mortgage that was more than they could afford to pay, 
they're missing the fact that the skin in the game is the homeowner. They're the one who's gonna lose their home. The bank has no skin in the game at all. It's gone. Uh, more than 50% are Fannie and Freddie, and those were financed by Fannie and Freddie before you ever got it with whatever bank claimed to have it. It's actually, they're using Fannie and Freddie's money. A huge chunk of them are using money or, or are projected to use the money from one of these supposedly securitized trusts. I mean, our estimate in Massachusetts is that something like 80 to 90% of the mortgages are held by one of these securitized trusts and they actually don't have the mortgage or Fannie and Freddie. So it's not other folks. I was, I Is that working? I just, I just wanted to ask one question on to the topic at hand, which is what have you done in Worcester to stop people's houses from being foreclosed on? Yeah, so we work statewide and I do a lot of the, because I'm the statewide coordinator, I do a lot of the development of legal um, materials and analyzing people's legal um, paperwork and stuff, so I see all of these illegalities. Um, but in a number of communities, Worcester being one, there are local groups that are organizing and they are being very effective. They door knock every weekend, the lists of folks who have auctions coming up, um, where they can connect with somebody, people always pretty much want to fight for their home, and it starts then with a series of actions taken to save the home. In Massachusetts, because we're a non-judicial foreclosure state, you don't get any enforcement at all, generally, until after the foreclosure when they try and evict you. So the trick is for people to know to stay in the home at the foreclosure, do not leave. It's how you keep your powers to hold on to the property. Um, and so in the Worcester area where I happen to live, I also get to kibitz the most with any of the local groups. In the Worcester area, several things have happened. The Worcester group decided that they were gonna fight for anybody who was willing to fight. So they weren't cherry picking, and that turned out to take a lot longer to get traction and visibility. But now where we are is investors, when they show up, if there's a protest by the Worcester anti-foreclosure team, they will not buy because they know they're getting a headache and they will not buy. So that's the first step in protecting people. Secondly, folks work in teams to help people fight the foreclosure in court. So while people come with no real knowledge usually about courts and how they work, they learn the arguments, they learn how to read their own paperwork, and they go in and often do better than the lawyers, including some of the expensive lawyers on the other side. Um, so that's beginning to make a difference. And then finally, in Worcester, there are now a series of steps that folks have put in place so that even if they get through the court, and the Worcester Housing Court is not enforcing anything, including court rules most of the time these days, um, people uh, blockade the eviction. And through that and a series of legal steps that people can take, the Worcester Anti-Foreclosure Team, as of yesterday, yes, as of yesterday, had stopped the 41 out of 45 attempted post-foreclosure evictions in the last six months. So, yeah. So it, it absolutely can be done, and if we could multiply what is happening in Worcester, and I think not quite as well, but in other ways well, in Springfield, across the state, we would become the headache for the, for the financial industry, um, probably in the country, and, well, definitely in the country, maybe in the world, I don't know, but um, all it takes is more people. Literally, we need more people and more financial resources because we know how to do it now. That's what the, the nine years so far of fighting have given us. We know what they're doing illegally. We know what the enforcement should be. We can get a certain amount of traction on that now, but numbers will turn the tide because they cannot handle, as is true of most oppressive uh, elements of government action, if people non-cooperate with it enough, they simply can't do it. So that was part of why I wanted to come talk to folks, is that we need more, more hands on deck, literally. Um, a few more hands on deck makes the difference between not just one or two people saving their homes, but networking people together so that they start learning from each other and backing each other. And it is dramatic watching what's happening. There was a bad law passed, and I know we need to get done. There was a bad law passed, um, and it's the one really bad thing our legislature has done, um, at the end of 2015, and we're trying to, we've got most of the elements to do a constitutional challenge. We will get rid of this law. But in the meantime, the way people can protect themselves is to file something at the Registry of Deeds. So we started reaching back to folks who were foreclosed longer ago, before we had a movement, before we had people organizing. And the sto horrifying stories I've heard now, it turns out that the ones before there was a movement were even worse. And um, 
not only do people die from the stress, and we've lost any number of folks who are fighting, but um, what they were doing before was even more reprehensible. It's also true that those folks, when they get engaged, boy, do they want to fight. So there's a sleeping uh, lion out there that the, that the powers that be are not prepared to deal with. And so um, if folks are willing to help door knock, reach out to make phone calls and uh, help us fundraise, et cetera, um, we will turn this on its head. And given, and I don't know what happened to our PowerPoint, but what is your organization called? the Mass Alliance Against Predatory Lending. And the website is www.maapl, our initials, Mass Alliance Against Predatory Lending, dot info. Um, and there's a way to, to get in touch with us there. There's a way to contribute money there. Um, I, at one point, was doing more of these speaking gigs, and we were getting to collect networks of activists because foreclosures are everywhere. They may have started in, in, the, in the working class neighborhoods of our secondary cities. The Boston area has been relatively untouched, um, and in rural areas, but they're now everywhere. And so um, we need teams of folks anywhere and everywhere in the state to do outreach and back people, especially if there's going to be an auction or an eviction. Is that it? Thank you.